Today, we are going to cover being a fractional CMO, refining your audience, and the big pendulum swings in marketing. I spoke with John Levine about this and much more in this episode. John is a fractional CMO who's worked with dozens of startups and even billion dollar companies, and he's helped them find their ideal growth strategy. He's also been a marketing leader internally at multiple companies. Let's dive right into the episode. For people that are not super familiar with fractional CMO work, I'm, I'm sure you can kind of guess what it is, but maybe if you wouldn't mind kind of walking through your day to day or what an average kind of agreement or deal looks like for, for fractional CMO work, where I don't know, just an idea of like what you're doing for companies. Cause there are definitely people sure. out there that have no clue. Yeah. And, and be honest, it's a, it's a term I struggle with as well, because I think some people are always like, what's fractional? Is it part-time? Are you, are you this or you're that? And then, so I try to simplify and say, you know, I am, I'm, I'm part advisor, part strategist and part doer. And I think a lot of that has to do with the size of the company. And then eventually, you know, the size of the engagement or what the engagement's asking for, but that's kind of a secondary thing. And, and typically when I say the size of the company is it, is it, is it a CEO or often an entrepreneur that's looking, you know, usually has either a very junior or maybe not even a team around them and just needs a, a thought leader, a partner, someone to bounce ideas off of. Someone to help to figure out, you know, some complex things or just where they should be going with their business or their brand. And that's kind of the advisor role. I think it starts to play in the, the strategic role where I think the team start to build um, and they need a little bit more process or how are we building out a team to a marketing strategy or how are we approaching a certain digital channel or, or non-digital channel? And then and I think the tactical is, hey, we need someone really in there to like lead this team and, and be here and, and what can you do? And I think at least for me, I like to say I can do a lot of those things. There's things I like to tell people like I'm, I'm, I know very, I, I know well enough to be dangerous. And there's things that I, you know, that are probably tactical roles that I'm willing to roll up my sleeves and do. Not that I want to do them all the time, but depending on what you need, I can, I can go there and do it for you. What is your background then that you, you most, most clients come to you and say, we want you to kind of like run with this channel or this strategy. Yeah. What is that thing for you? Yeah, I mean, my, my background is, is channel agnostic. I, I grew up and learned my kind of, I guess, trade um, pre-direct consumer. I started out in the brand world. I've been doing this almost 20 years, building and launching brands when, you know, pre-meta and when Reddit launched. So we went straight to retail. We had to build community. We had to build awareness around what we were launching and what we were doing in order to, to keep a walking down the shelf knew exactly what this product was in, in one case of a startup I was part of. To, you know, how do you start building a community? Because that's what Facebook was about in the, in the beginning. You know, it was, we, we, I remember sitting in meetings where we had, you know, on the wall, like how are we getting to 10,000 likes, 20,000 likes and, and nothing to do with dollars being spent or anything else, but how do we build that channel? And then of course, over time, you know, how to build my expertise in, in kind of all the different digital channels there. But so, you know, I've been, you know, I, I built my career across all that, especially on the startup side. And then I consulted to a lot of big brands. As, as you know, and there it was just, it was really figuring out like growth strategies. Like what is usually for the bigger brands, it's like, what's going on? What are the newer brands doing that we don't know about? Bigger brands are often, you know, slower to react to and, and take advantage of things. So as channels started to develop, a lot of the work was always around, well, well how do we take advantage of these for us as a, you know, be any category financial services down to an apparel brand that I've worked with. So it sounds like you've, you've really morphed into like, you have to be the, the ultimate growth person. And that that's what people are looking for. Is that, is that kind of a fair assumption that, that growth is the main thing and then it channels out from there? Growth is the main thing for sure. I think what I like to tell, I guess, clients I work with now too, is like, I want to help you steer you in the right direction of, of where you should be investing your dollars and time and resources and money all for the, the goal of growth. But I think a lot of times, especially entrepreneurs, they, they either want to do so many different things and stretch themselves too thin. And how do we, you know, how do we simplify business a little bit more or what are the type of people that we need to hire? And I think I help do that as well. It's like, how do we put the right people in place, either as a freelancer or fractional person or a full-time hire that can get you to the next level of growth and then the next level and the next level and the next level after that. So when, when you're working with a new client, let's say, what do you have like a checklist of green flags that you're kind of looking for in a company where you're like, if they hit this, 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 and this, you pretty much know you can help them grow. 
Is is there a checklist of those things? Yes. And I, I come back to, again, I think the checklists are different depending on the size of the company. I think sub 5 million has a, a checklist as like sub 25 million and then probably sub 100 million has a different checklist, even though there's a lot of commonalities across those. I think, you know, for a lot of the sub $5 million brands, especially ones who may have launched in the last three years, or, you know, like everyone talks about, you know, pre iOS changes and all those things, the focus on creative was secondary to those brands. And so they built a pro, they made a product, they put up a website. It was pretty good. It functioned, it converted. They were able to put ads out there that drove traffic, that then bought their product and their product at the end of the day. You know, there's a product market fit, as I like to say, and those are the brands I like to get involved with anyways. I mean, you know, there's a proof of concept. People like their product. They're coming back and buying it again. Often then they, I, I, more than, more than often or not in those brands, they come to me and say, well, my, my growth seems to start to plateau and something's wrong with my, you know, my agency or something's wrong over here with my, this digital channel or that digital channel. And, and I think one of the biggest things is the checklist is creative in today's world. Like they've started to lose you know, the communication of what they're telling the current customer. And to me, that's creative. When you come on a website, you have a couple seconds to convey a message. And so how do you say it? You know, what's it look like and how do you, and how do you get there? And so I think that's a common thing that every brand I've seen in, uh, so, you know, two and a half years of being a, a fractional CMO. And even when I, my last full-time in-house hire, which I spent three years at, was the same story. It's every time we hit a different plateau in each of these clients, it always came back to to that. And then we would rebuild creative on top of, okay, all the tactics we were going to do within that channel. And then we'd have to start over and then start over again. I'm, I'm sure after all the people that you've talked to, like prospects, actual clients, at this point, you kind of also know the flip side of this, which is red flags, I guess, but, but maybe flipping that in a, in a more positive light. Like if a company comes to you, what are some of the things that indicate maybe they're not ready for a fractional CMO yet? I'd say the first is willing to invest and it doesn't have to be a lot of dollars, but invest in either a channel or rebuilding something internally, rebuilding a website or fixing a website because of conversion rate, or like I said, investing deeper into a channel because we're seeing something working. Doesn't, you know, clearly if it's working so well, they probably would have done that already, but often they're either not getting the right information or not looking at it correctly to say, oh, there is an opportunity here for us to further invest. If they're not willing to invest, it's often that's a red flag because I'm here to help lay out that roadmap and say, here's the opportunities. We don't have to do them all, but I'm going to lay them out and I'm going to even help prioritize where we should be spending time and effort. And time and effort to me is investing also. It's not just about dollars. And if you can't do that, then my work is not going to be really meaningful to you. And I'm not going to know if I can actually grow because if you're really looking for someone to take over a specific channel, you know, someone who is a, you know, your media buyer that can help, you know, optimize your meta platform, then, you know, I'm always very honest say, okay, well, I can help you find that person too, because maybe that's what you need. You just want someone to be really in-depth in the weeds doing that, but I can't help you overall then figure out like, how do we take you from X to Y? You, you had mentioned how you used to have more of a full-time role doing the same thing, but now you've, you've gone off on your own. Maybe would love to just know why you made that decision and why the freelance or the fractional route was for you and what were some of the key indicators that that's kind of what you wanted to do? Yeah, I'd say it's a couple of reasons. I mean, there's, there's always going to be a personal element to all these things. I decided I, I took a, a business from that was bootstrapped into a few million dollars in, in sales to when I walked away or I left the company, it was going to cross the $30 million fresh threshold and be venture backed. And digging that all, especially as probably seems like decades ago now, but as we all kind of shoved to, you know, rushed home and we're locked up in our houses, um, it seemed like uh, the hours got longer and longer <laughs> and everyone was trying to figure out what was going to come next and knew, no one knew it was going to come around the corner of the pandemic. And I think with all of that going on and just quite honestly, working a lot and just seeing that growth. I first did it to just kind of take a breath and say, Hey, this was, this was a great ride. What do I want to do next? What what's the next business I want to go build? And I built a couple of businesses before this as well. So wasn't the, the first time I'd done this. And, you know, in order during that time, 
I wanted to work still. I didn't want to just that, you know, I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't travel, couldn't, couldn't take off because we we're all sick at home. So I started to do this consulting and fractional work, which is actually how I had gone to my last startup. It became one of my, it was one of my clients I ended up on full time. And so I said, let's, let's see if I can repeat that and, and see where it goes. And, and as, as we got through the beginning of the pandemic, we knew that there was going to be this, I guess, so we like to say the COVID bump in the D2C world and, and things were going well. Um, more and more opportunities came and I, and I love the diversity of working with different clients in different areas. And so I think that's what kept me going. I have in my career over these 20 years bounced back and forth between running startups and a very specific product to being on the agency side where I worked across multiple categories at the same time. Um, and there's pros and cons to both and I love both of them. But as I started doing this, this was fun because I got to, you know, be on a call at one point talking about a, you know, lifestyle brand and the next time I'm talking about a food and beverage brand. And then moving to a service oriented company. And while, you know, sometimes it felt a little uh, schizophrenic jumping around, it was also fun because I also was able to, I am able to figure out where there are synergies. Maybe it's not the exact same thing that each brand is doing, but there's a lot of the similarities that everyone's either struggling with or seeing success in. And how do we take that and then morph it into a different category and see if that same tactic or, or idea could work in that other category? I'm curious to know, like, how how you thought about marketing yourself as you've become the business. Maybe a lot of it's been word of mouth, but are there instances where you've kind of built a marketing strategy for how to how to get yourself out there, how to attract more prospects and meet the right clients? Yeah. I'm thinking more of the word of mouth marketing approach. So it's not it's not super passive, but I wouldn't say I've tried to be kind of the the influencer on LinkedIn or Twitter or some of these other channels. I think when I do, I'm trying to attract also the, I think the right type of client and work with the right business. And I think I don't have personally the time or the, or the desire to weed through a lot of other things. And so I've worked hard to kind of execute with my current clients and build a reputation. Um, and with an ecosystem, because so many of these startups and people talk with each other and, and are always looking for the next thing that I've been, I think pretty successful there. And even on platforms such as Market Hire, I think the same thing goes for that, is that being successful that uh, with certain clients have allowed me to continue with, with, you know, more clients coming in, do something like that. So I think it's been a hybrid of those. I mean, I've done some of I've signed on panels, I've done podcasts and interviews and blog posts and things like that. I just have found that for me, the, the better clients that I've been able to, to get and be successful with have come through a smaller network. Yeah, that makes sense. The the better clients usually are more hard won. The the ones that come easy are are not gonna pan out as much right. usually. So yeah, that's 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 definitely interesting. I, I am curious, like flipping gears a little bit to back to your your startup experience. You've worked with kind of a, a big range of companies, like big ones, small ones, all, all across the spectrum there. When you start thinking about marketing strategy from scratch. Like nothing exists, you're coming in and you're the one that has to basically start building it. What are some of those questions that you're asking yourself to help you at least get to for, from zero to one? To get myself, well, more often than not, and given the, what you said, the range of clients that we have, there, there's the, the product market fit, like I talked about, has already been established. So people like the rock, and I do work with startups that have not launched yet, and, and it's a slightly different approach that I'll take, but let's, we can, positive for a second, those who started to generate revenue, started to build traffic to their sites and, and have that opportunity. I, you know, I often like to, you know, the very first thing is like, take a step back and just, just audit, you know, no better run that everything that has gone on and everything they're doing that they may not even know that they're doing. And this could be, you know, this is everything from, you know, in a very traditional way, I look across their paid earned and owned channels and everything that they're doing, what channels are they in, how are they doing it? Where they seeing success, not success, what things they're talking about, you know, on their website, you know, what pages are people visiting? What products are they buying? Are they bundling this with other products and other things? How can we get some consumer data on this? You know, I also, you know, as I mentioned, you know, come from a, a you know, I, I start, I learned my trade in the up brand marketing world. And so much of that is about consumer insights and understanding who your customer is why they, you know, what are, what are their needs and, and why, you know, why would they come and buy your product versus a competitive one? And so I spend time really trying to think that through and understand that. And, and 
often a lot of smaller brands haven't thought that through. Again, they, they launched a, they had a really good idea and a really good product and were able to put it out there and people came to start buying it, but they don't, don't necessarily, they, they think they knew who their customer is, but how do we hone that in? Because that's going to help dictate, you know, specifically what channels, what type of messaging you use, what type of creative, how do we make the buying experience easier? And so that's, I'll, I'll start with that. And that could be a quick sprint or that could take me, you know, two months, depending on the client and the desire and how much they really want to go in depth on that. And I've done both of those where it's a two week sprint and a two month sprint. Once we have that, then it, it really, what I like to do is prioritize in my own mind, here are the, the top things that I think will help us, you know, start to grow or take us to the next level or, or whatever that is and put that up against you know, all the opportunities and what's it going to take. And, and then it starts becoming industry conversations around trade-offs, right? Time versus money versus, you know, this is not going to have a huge return, but it's really easy for us to do. So we should do it now because over the long run, it can have huge benefits. This is going to take a lot of time, a lot of money, but if we actually don't start it now, we're never going to see it at all. So it's, you know, there are certain tactics that will take six months to ever even see any success. So every day you wait, it's another six months out. How important, how big do we think this is going to be for us? And if we think it's going to be a big opportunity, we should start now versus oh, it's still not going to be the big we can start later. And so we started having those conversations. And that, to me, that's kind of how we get from kind of zero to one pretty quickly. And then because from there, then we're off to, you know, starting to execute. I, yeah, I want to, I want to cover the audience side, but, but really quickly on the success side, there's, there's obviously so many metrics and every client's going to have different goals, but just as as like holistically as you possibly can what how do you really gauge success with your clients how do you try to come to terms and come with, into full alignment with them on what success looks like so how how i see success with my clients I, there's there's the, the the personal internal way of success which is i guess tenure you're right the longer i stay around the client as long as they need what i'm doing and i've had those honest conversations where at this point, they need to be, you know, using other resources and on there's, you should be using me. And I've had those where it's not worth paying me. That'd be the first, I think, level of success for me. Now, why are they keeping me around? It's because we're seeing, we're seeing growth. I think at the end of the day is, you know, we are seeing very basically sales go up and we're seeing that because we're getting more efficient on our advertising, our conversion rates going up, our AOP is going up. There's no one metric, I would say that it is. Most often we have those metrics, but again, it's dependent on what are the client overall goals. You know, we might have a very health, healthy conversion rate. So it's really about how to get more eyeballs to the site and get them to that funnel because we can convert them. I have had plenty of clients where, you know, getting people to the site's not a problem and our advertising is not a problem and even our organic efforts aren't really that much of a problem. We can always do better. But right now the, the biggest problem is, you know, our conversion rate is, you know, so, so small that if we move that up by, you know, a quarter of a point, your sales have, you know, quadrupled overnight. I mean, like there's a, so, and, and while that might take some work to do, it's not so simple. It's smarter and better work often than trying to sit there and throw more dollars at advertising or other things, because once we figure that out, it's going to pay dividends in spades. And so if we can identify those things and the client agrees that those are the main pain points and the, and the things hampering growth, and we can start to solve that. I think that's where success definitely comes in. Yeah. And in the foundation you had mentioned earlier with, uh, with really understanding the audience and that being something that more people than you would think don't actually understand their audience. I've, I've definitely seen that too. But if, if we're drilling down a bit further in like an example, if you were working with a client that kind of knew who their audience was, but really needed to hone in on it and, and get more specific, what are some questions that you would start asking to get them from very general understanding of audience to much more specific? What I like to do is really figure out just not who the audience is that, you know, that's a specific demographic. It's a 35 year old female that makes a hundred thousand dollars a year. But you know, what are the products that this person buys, not just in the category, but outside the category, where do they shop? How do they shop? Um, how often do they do it? Like, what are all the different buying behaviors and, and, you know, like we say, like psychographic things that they were doing, you know, what magazines are they reading online? What influencers do they follow on social media that are well-known, you know, like celebrities and things like that. And so, you know, 
again, this comes down to how in depth does the client want to see this, but also, uh, as someone who spent time in agencies and did a ton of consumer insight work for you know, billion dollar brands, there's benefits and there's cons to it. Sometimes it's just research and it's a bunch of charts on a, on a slide and big companies love that because it allows them to, you know, point at that and, you know, move it up the, the food chain internally for, for startups and fresh in, in, in this world. Like, what are we going to do with this information? How are we going to use it? There was a client of mine, if, if an example helps, one of my first clients when I became a factor CMO in the, in the food space was in 15, that is found in 15,000 retail doors from Whole Foods, from Walmart to Whole Foods and had a small but growing, you know, omni-channel D2C business as well. The challenge is it was a category in, in barbecue sauces and rubs that doesn't get purchased that often. Right, because I'm sure most people look at the refrigerator. We we all discuss that they probably sit in the refrigerator for a long time. So, you know, our biggest thing for consumer, we we did a pretty in depth consumer insight study, both qualitative and quantitative. Was like, why are people even buying our product, and how do we get them to buy it more often? What could we do to encourage use and therefore purchase? And so, while I identified who the audience was demographically and things like that, what we really dug into is like, why do they even use the category? Why do they use your product and what could we do from an organization that would then translate into marketing or other initiatives that would encourage them to use the product more often and therefore come back and buy the product more often. I, I love it. Yeah, no, I, I love the, the the idea of like going well beyond, not just deeper in terms of the who, but the buying behavior. I've, I've worked with, with clients and, and internally as well. And that's not a question that comes up very often. So. That's a, that's a huge takeaway. Now that you've been doing this for, for a while now, not just the fractional CMO stuff, but marketing in general, you've been around this for, for a long time now. I'm curious how, you've, how you perceive the evolution of marketing from the time that you've started to now. There's obviously been a huge digital shift, but just in, in terms of what's important or what you like to do since the beginning of your career until now, how has that evolved? Yeah, something I mentioned a little earlier, but I think the, the, the pendulum has been fun to watch it kind of swing back and forth. And there's been some online debates that I've, I followed and participated in around kind of the, the, the competition between brand and performance marketing. And I think that all encapsulates what marketing is. I, I've always kind of tried to build my career out of the intersection between the two. I like to call it creativity and commerce, where there's great storytelling, creative, and how, but how to use data to inform that. I think where it's where things have evolved and shifted is, you know, you go back only 10 years ago, you know, 15 years ago, for sure. And when, as I mentioned, when I launched, you know, an early startup, there was, there was performance marketing in some channels. We had to do some direct mail. We had to do some couponing, things like that. But really it was about brand marketing. We had to, you know, get people to be aware of our brand, understand what we did, and then go find it in the retail. And then as the, the rise of direct consumer, and then of course, you know, with, Meta and Google and all these other channels, it became very performance marketing driven and people gave up on brand for a while. And I, you know, aging me, but I laughed at a lot of people who are now talking about, oh, you got to bring back brand marketing because they only, they grew up, right? They graduated college four years ago, five years ago. They only knew performance marketing. It worked for a couple of years. And now they said, oh, it's getting harder. You got to build a brand. You got to build community. You got to do these things. And, and this is what I, I've kind of been part of this whole, you know, pendulum for 15 plus years in marketing. And so I've, I've enjoyed watching that because I think at the end of the day, I don't think there's one right or wrong. I think it's how do you find the, the intersection, the, media, the, the middle between those two things? Because you're always going to want to date. The more data you have at any time in this kind of marketing life cycle, the, the, the smarter and the better you are. But if you only rely on data, you're going to hit a plateau. And again, on this flip side, and I've worked at agencies or worked with them, if you're only making the most beautiful website in the world, these great ads are so beautiful and there's no performance metrics tied to them. You're going to look great. Everyone's going to talk to you for, or talk about you for a very short time. And then sales are going to drop off. But if you can do both of those things really well at a certain level is where you start to see success and you see the best brands. That's kind of how they grow. It's interesting. The principles always stay the same, but the way that we do the marketing changes a ton. And right now we're in this AI thing. So this'll, this'll be my last little nugget here and and we can sign off but ai is the next pendulum swing we've come back on some of those principles like you've mentioned but 
That's the next thing where everybody's wondering, how do I use AI for marketing? I'm just, I just want to get your two cents on it. Like how you perceive AI for marketing, if you use it, what you honestly think. Yeah, definitely using it. Definitely trying to educate myself and get smarter at it. I'm by no means an expert yet on it. I don't know if anyone really is, but I'm trying to follow those who all say they are because I'm learning from them. I think it's going to make everyone potentially, I said, more smarter and more efficient for sure. I mean, the way I use it is to make myself more efficient. It helps me get 80% to what I need. I have not been able to get it to 100%. And I don't know if it ever will, depending. And I think it depends on what you do and what category and stuff. But, you know, it gets me to a place that allows me then to say, hey, I didn't have to waste the last hour or two hours trying to come up with these ideas or think through this thing. But now the ideas are there. If that was an example, how does this really work with my brand or my business? How do I tweak this? How do I make it stronger or take things out? And I, 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 I think I've had the most success there where it's helped me be a lot more efficient in certain areas of what I do. I've yet to see it like answer questions I need to answer, but that's what I'm trying to see who's, who's doing that and how, how are they doing that? But I think, I think it's just making everyone that much smarter and more efficient. 